welcome to the care and keeping of your Indiana pouch, a treatment talk from the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. Bladder cancer will affect over 80,000 people every year. Of those 80,000 new diagnoses, about 25,000 people will be diagnosed with muscle invasive bladder cancer. Bladder removal is a common treatment for muscle invasive bladder cancer. And one of the diversion options after bladder removal is an Indiana pouch, sometimes called a continent cutaneous pouch. The Indiana pouch was pioneered in 1985 at the Indiana University School of Medicine. My name is Morgan Stout and I'm the Outreach and Education Manager at Beacon. I'm joined today by Dr. Erin Laviana from Dell Medical School at UT Austin and our patient advocates, Scott and Cindy. Welcome. First, I will hand it over to Dr. Laviana to talk about the medical aspect of creating and caring for an Indiana pouch. And then we'll hear from Scott and Cindy about the lived experience. With that, I will hand it over to you, Dr. Laviana. Perfect. Thank you so much, Morgan. And uh, it's really an honor to, to, to be here today and this evening. And thank you for taking the time uh, to be a part of this. And so I'm just gonna share my screen here with everybody. Hopefully you can see this. Uh, so we, this past weekend- oh, it's we had in our, presenter view, Dr. Um, Laviana. What's that? It's in presenter view. Can you switch the- Oh yeah. Let's go to slide. Okay, is this better? It is, thank you. Perfect. So th this past weekend, we had our um, annual American Urologic Association conference. And one of the highlights of that always is what's called the, the Whitmore Lecture as part of the Society of Urologic Oncology. And Dr. Dr. Isla Skinner is the chair at Stanford and she gave the talk this year. And one of the things she focused on was just the differences between conduits, Indiana pouches, and neobladders. And one of the lines that really resonated with me was she said, you can talk any patient into getting an ileal conduit if you want them to get an ileal conduit. Um, and, and, and it really strikes a, a chord there because I, Indiana pouches in particular are very underutilized. And how much of that is just with people being uncomfortable with the operation or um, just not having exposure to them. And, and, and so I definitely think this is a very underutilized operation here. Um, and the more we can give exposure to it for, for the right patient, I think it can really go a, a long way. And a lot is not tonight too, is I, I want the patient experience to really be emphasized um, from both Cindy and Scott who have both undergone this operation and, and can share their experiences. Because at the end, end of the day, I think that is what is most important. And so uh, we'd just like to thank our, our Treatment Talk sponsors here as, as listed above. And then I wanna start by just giving an overview of, of what an Indiana pouch actually is. And so this is a picture here of, of both the small intestine and the colon. And so the Indiana pouch is actually a combination of the two of them. As you transition from the small intestine over to the colon, there's something called an ileocecal valve. And that valve is what's used in this operation to actually provide the continence mechanism or that, that's what helps prevent the, the, the leakage of urine after this operation. So approximately 50 centimeters of small intestine are, are harvested or cut, and then the rest of the bowel is sewed back together. And you can see this better in the next slide here. And so this picture on the left here that's labeled A, on the right part of that screen, that, that is the actual pouch, and you can see the Foley catheter with the balloon going into the pouch. And then that area on the farther left there is where it narrows and, and comes out to the skin. However, it's that, that sort of that junction there um, of where that ileocecal valve is that provides the continence. If you, if you move over to B here, you, you can see sort of how big this pouch is. The, 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 those blue tubes are the stents coming from the ureters into the pouch. And, and that yellow thing is the catheter that comes out to the skin. And then finally on the right side here, this is the last picture, of the Indiana pouch, you can see the pouch on the inside, and then you can see the quote unquote stoma on, on the patient's outside that they then have to catheterize through. And so what actually is the Indiana, Indiana pouch here? It's, it's basically considered an, artif an artificial bladder that, that, that's inside of your body that one empties with a detachable catheter, typically, typically called, uh, also known as sometimes a Foley catheter or, or a, a red rubber or a silicone catheter. There's, there's many different names, but, or an in and out catheter, but it's something that, that does not stay inside. 
Uh, and it helps wearing, it helps avoid wearing an external urine bag and, and, and results or hopefully results in normal urinary control. And so what to expect during an Indiana pouch. And so the, the urologist or team of urologist, which is often the case, builds a new bladder pouch from your colon and small intestine. The, the, the pouch then connects to, to a piece of, of intestine instead of your urethra. It comes to the skin. Typically, it's a dime size opening. Uh, many people do, do, do refer to it as a stoma. And then you drain, the, you drain urine from the pouch by catheterizing the stoma. Um, this will change over time, but ultimately, once you hit this sort of equilibrium, you catheterize every four to six hours. Most oftentimes, it's, it's, it's located in, in the right lower abdomen. And typically, catheterizing is not a painful experience. So what are the benefits of an Indiana pouch versus a ileal conduit or, or a neobladder? Uh, compared to an ileal conduit, it, it ideally avoids having a urostomy bag. You have normal urinary control during the day and night. You can also, depending on your preferences, place it below the belt line. And so it's not visible, uh, such as when you're at the beach. And then it's also a good option when the cancer has spread to the urethra uh, and you can't do a neobladder. In females as well, it's uh, sometimes a better option because anytime you get a neobladder, you have to be counseled on the need for self-catheterization, which can be much more difficult uh, with a neobladder as opposed to an Indiana pouch. Uh, and last but not least, it, it does have the highest um, urinary control satisfaction. The ileal conduit obviously will leak continuously Neobladders almost assuredly will leak at night, at least for the first year. And sometimes there's problems with daytime continence as well. Um, so an Indiana pouch, when it goes well, uh, definitely has the highest urinary control satisfaction. Now, on the converse side, why don't we just give everyone an Indiana pouch? Um, and some of the disadvantages here are you, by having this pouch, you're never going to be able to urinate normally. The only way to evacuate your urine is to catheterize, and you're going to have to catheterize for the rest of your life. Uh, and, and, and typically, it's every four to six hours, but, but that may vary. Also, because of the large size of the intestines involved, um, in particular, the, the colon as well, you need to rinse and irrigate out your stoma daily since, since it makes mucus. Now, some of this mucus production will go down over time. But for many people, they have to continuously uh, irrigate this Indiana pouch for their entire life. It's also a complex surgery. As I'll show you a, a few pictures and diagrams here, when you wake up after surgery, you have many tubes and drains. Um, some of these can get clogged. Some of these can, can, can change angles. Sometimes the catheterization can get difficult. Uh, and there's a potential, there's a potential for, for side effects. And, and the extra hours of, of doing this can, can take a toll on the body. So it's not for, it's not for everybody. Um, this next slide, I just, just wanna give you a heads up here. It does contain a picture of a surgical procedure. So if you're uncomfortable with the sight of blood or, or tubes momentarily, um, take a look away here. And I'll let you know when that slide has passed. So this picture here uh, on the right and left is a picture of a patient. I, I performed an Indiana pouch on several months ago. And, and, and this was in the initial post-op period here. So on the top left here, this is the stoma. This is, this is where the patient ultimately catheterized through. However, to wake up and to make sure that the Indiana pouch is adequately draining, also place what's called a 24 French Malincott catheter. And that, that, that's basically a large bore catheter that goes into the Indiana pouch and that, and that, and that gets removed. Below that and the lower left side are two urinary stents, and those are draining the, the kidneys in, in ureters to divert as much of that urine as possible in the initial period. I do this operation robotically for the most part here, so he, he has several tiny incisions from the robotic ports. And on the right side of the screen, that drain is just draining abdominal fluid. And then as you can see on the right side of this, on the right photo here, it's the same picture but you can see the catheter draining um, where, where you're going to catheterize through, through the stoma. And then the, and then the bottom left piece is, is just a bag to collect the urine in the initial post-operative period. So what to expect after going in Indiana pouch? So, and, and you can look back if you, if you looked away there, but so after going to the Indiana pouch, you're going to wake up with a lot of tubes and drains that, that'll, that can be confusing for yourself, but also for, for many of the nurses and, and, and other hospital staff, as if this operation is not done 
very often people may not be used to seeing all these tubes and drains. So one of the things that's important is that they're all labeled appropriately and that everyone has a great understanding of what, of what purpose each of them serve. The patients will typically recover in the hospital for about a week after surgery, plus or minus based on how they're doing. With the, I always say the real bottleneck of the surgery is waiting for the patient to have a bowel movement because you have to cut a, a segment of bowel and reconnect it as goes with any cystectomy. Uh, sometimes you can get swelling at that staple site and, and until the patients are able to pass a bowel movement, that, that's typically when they're able to go home. The, 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 now this can vary from practice to practice, but typically we keep the drains in for about three weeks and then get an x-ray, something called a pouchogram to make sure the pouch is sealed and that there's no leaks. Once there's no leak, then, then we, we can begin to take these catheters out one at a time here, sort of saving one as a safety, as a safety or a pacifier. God forbid there's any issues with, with, with catheterizing the, the stoma. And then it's also important to note that the surgery does take a toll uh, on the patient. Patients typically lose about 10 to 15 pounds during the recovery, uh, but it takes a full almost two months for, for weight to stabilize, if not, if not longer. And, and so that's always important to counsel um, for patients before going through, through this operation. <clears throat> about one and a half to two months in, you should be able to go back to your normal activities. It typically takes though about eight weeks until you wake up and you feel like you've never, never had an operation, um, which can be a substantial amount of time. And then over the next year, you can slowly wait longer and longer to empty urine as your pouch stretches. In the beginning, we want you emptying that pouch every two hours um, just to make sure it doesn't stretch out too quickly, both for, from a leak standpoint and, and then just from a retention of urine standpoint. And then eventually your pouch will be able to hold as much as a normal bladder. Sort of the, the sweet spot here is being able to catheterize every four to six hours for residuals of about five to 600 cc's or, or milliliters of urine. As you go over that, you, you just, you get, you're at higher risk of, of, of getting bladder stones uh, or pouch stones, which then may lead to further interventions and operations. So how does someone with this artificial bladder know if they need to urinate? And so most people will feel abdominal tightness or mild cramps uh, that should not be particularly painful, but they typically feel uncomfortable, sort of as having a full bladder. And then some, some patients will see their stomach sticking out on their right side where the pouch is located when, when, when very full, but that's not everybody. What about needing to wear pads or an adult diaper? So if you're undergoing a neobladder, we always counsel patients on this, that there are a high likelihood of leaking. And as I said earlier, they're definitely going to leak at night. Uh, for an Indiana pouch, however, you should be able to wear regular underwear. And most people wear a Band-Aid or a small pad to keep the amount of mucus um, that the stoma makes from, from getting on their underwear. Now, in the beginning phases of this, though, it is common to, to, to leak urine, especially as that neobladder is expanding. And so in that case, you may wear pads or you even may wear a, a, a conduit bag over it in the beginning until you sort of get in your routine and you're comfortable with, uh, with, with how you're living your daily activities. For, for instance, if you know you're going to be out and about for several hours or even longer than that, you may, you may want to more, wear a more protective barrier until you sort of get used to everything. Um, but it's, it's definitely person dependent there. And what are a few other things to consider about an Indiana pouch? Well, for starters, it's not uncommon to, to have urine, urinary tract infections. You, you basically have a artificial bladder made out of intestine, which can have some bacteria in it, and you're also holding urine. Uh, and sometimes, especially the more urine you hold, the more prone you can become to, to infections. And when you tie the ureters, or sew the ureters into this pouch, you can also have reflux of urine back up the ureters and into the kidneys, and that can also cause infections. It's really important that you know how to irrigate with a neobladder as the mucus can build up. It can not only clog the catheters, but can also lead to, 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 to kidney stone formation. And you will have to continuously irrigate that pouch to, to drain the mucus and help prevent these stones. Uh, another thing is because of the large amount of intestine you have to take to build this, that, that sometimes it leads to more acid reabsorption and you have too much acid in your blood. And as a result, you have to take something called bicarbonate um, or bicarb to, 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 to help counteract all the acid buildup in your blood. You can also have something called vitamin B12 deficiency and some other vitamin deficiencies. So it's important that you get your labs checked 
routinely as well. A few other things is that leakage from the stoma may occur and the mucus may leak out. Not all of these, unfortunately, are perfect. And a lot of this uh, comes down to the mechanism of, of, of how you sort of um, buttress the, the, this ileocecal valve I talked about. And that part is very important. Some do work better than others. And, and so for some patients, we'll, we'll leak more th than other patients. But hopefully, as it matures and gets to, to its steady state here, uh, the leakage is not a huge problem. You can also get stomal narrowing. So on the outside where you're catheterizing, that area can, can narrow and stricture down, and that can make it difficult to, to catheterize and empty the pouch. Sometimes that, that, that needs to be revised. Also, you can get what's called a peristomal hernia, or it's sort of a, a muscle laxity or fascial defect around there where the, the, the intestines in the Indiana pouch actually push out against your skin, and that can change the angle for catheterizing that can make it more and more difficult. The other thing is you have to schedule emptying of your Indiana pouch during the night, especially in the beginning. As it, as it goes along, I do have some patients who absolutely refuse to get up to, to empty the, their neobladder, but you have to understand that, that that's putting you a little more at risk of having urinary tract infections and, and getting stones. And another important thing to consider is just getting a medical alert bracelet. Uh, God forbid you ever run into trouble, Depending on what hospital or urgent care or freestanding emergency room you go to, many of the providers may not be familiar with an Indiana pouch. It's not uncommon that, that these providers have never even seen one. And so just, just making them aware, especially if you get any imaging studies done uh, from the radiologist standpoint too, that, that they fully understand what you had done and what your anatomy is supposed to, to, to look like. Now, what about these adjustment phases here? So, so, so with regard to leaking, especially in the beginning, as your pouch is learning how to hold urine as it's growing in size, it's normal that, it, that it's going to leak. This is normal and not something to necessarily panic over in the beginning. Um, it should get better and oftentimes does. What about irritability? So there's times, especially when you're learning to catheterize here, that you've been on a very regular schedule, let's say catheterizing every four hours, days, even weeks, maybe a month. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, you have to increase the frequency of, of catheterizing. Sometimes th th there's more swelling around the pouch uh, that, that can cause this. And, and this is not unusual as the pouch is learning its new function. But you also may have a mild urinary tract infection that doesn't present with, with, with fevers and chills, but with just frequency or, or maybe a change in odor. Uh, and, and in that case, antibiotics will, will help fix that. What about difficulty passing the catheter? And so one of these things is for, from quote unquote trauma uh, of the catheterization, this can actually cause swelling there. Uh, and that can be normal. It just may take more time to, to catheterize yourself, but it eventually will resolve. You also may feel the contours of the limb. So, so, so the limb is the piece that connects the pouch to the skin. And, and they're all different shapes and sizes, especially as it sort of scars in. And so you may feel that as it passes around corners. And then oftentimes when you enter the pouch, you do feel a pop. And that's the pop going through that valve, that ileocecal valve, that is the continence mechanism. But that can be alarming to, to, to patients, especially in the beginning. One of the tricks here to, to, to help facilitate or to help ease with inserting the catheter is to roll the catheter between your fingers, which may help. And then also another thing is straining or bearing down can make it more difficult. Uh, as, as that pressure of the intra-abdominal pressure from straining can compress that limb, making it difficult to pass the catheter. So in that case, it's always a good idea to try to relax your abdomen and your core as much as possible to place that catheter. And then also in the beginning, water-soluble lubricants such as KY jelly, surgical lube can help uh, pass the catheter. Your, 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 your limb and the pouch are natural lubricants. So often with time, you don't even need a, a lubrication. But the key here is don't use Vaseline as that can, plug the, that can plug the catheter. And what about for other troubleshooting? So it's not unusual to see flux of blood in the year, and this is normal. You also may see it on any pads, or, pads you're using to cover your stoma. They can sometimes get irritated and scraped from the catheter. And then what about failure to adequately empty the pouch? This can lead to some frustration and, and unfortunately it can, can be normal. You may, not every pouch is a perfect sphere and you may have little segments of, of, of small 
um, pouch components that, that you have to maneuver the catheter around to different areas to fully drain that Indiana pouch. And some of that improves with different positions. Some do better with standing, some with sitting, some hunched over, um, but the patient sort of gets to know that with time. And then gentle pressure on the area of that pouch may also help. And then what about thick mucus? So, so you may notice a change in the consistency of your mucus. One of the most common causes of this is just from not drinking enough fluids. And so patients will note a difference in their mucus thinning by the more water they drink just to dilute the mucus. Um, and so it's recommended to drink eight to 10 glasses of water or fluids in total per day. Uh, I have some patients who drink upwards of, of 15 plus um, of fluids. If you're gonna go super, super high, it's just good to check your labs and make sure all of your electrolytes are, are intact. But for, for most of those patients, it's not an issue. And then leaking at night can also occur. Uh, one of the main culprits there is just drinking up until bedtime. So any diuretics such as coffee or alcohol will increase uh, urine production, especially at night, and then not cutting off fluids or having fluids right before you go to bed will obviously make more urine at night, and that can lead to problems also. And then, and then what about irrigation of in a pouch? I just wanted to go over this because I think it's important how to actually irrigate. And, and the purpose of irrigating is to, for starters, minimize that mucus building up and getting that out of it. And as we talked about, helps prevent stone formation and also prevents infection. Now, th th this is typically done one to two times per day, but if you're one who has more mucus, uh, some patients are doing this more, more than twice a day. So what are the steps here? So the irrigation steps in general are, are first, just gather all the equipment, make, and make sure you have everything ready to irrigate, wash your hands thoroughly, and then cleanse the end of the catheter with at least 70% alcohol, and then rinse it off with warm water and shake off any excess. You can lubricate the catheter if you're not using pre-lubricated catheters, uh, but over time, this often is not needed as, as, as your channel is naturally lubricated. And then insert the catheter into the stoma and advance until there's a return of urine. If the catheter isn't draining well or if there's nothing back, remove the catheter um, and run it under hot water to remove any potential mucus plugs and then reinsert. And then with the TUMI, it's also known as a catheter tip or piston syringe, drop 60 cc's of, of saline and instill into the pouch. You can buy the saline or some people actually make their own saline and then let the fluid drain by gravity. After the drainage is stopped, you always wanna rotate the catheter about a quarter of the way turn and withdraw it and then push it back in. And this helps you get some of these other pouches that, 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 that may have been missed with the initial catheter. Is you basically want to just sweep the entire pouch at least twice to try to drain all, all that excess urine. And then you're going to remove the catheter. Typically, patients like to fold the catheter on, on the way out, and that's just to prevent it from, from, from leaking it and splashing all over. Some patients do reuse the catheters. M many have those one-time uh, disposable use catheters, but, but some who do reuse it, um, they actually microwave the catheters once per week, however, one at a time, so, so that they're not melting all together. 